Praise the Lord. Well, would you go to the book of Daniel, chapter 8, and we're going to continue our look at Daniel here. There we go. Daniel, chapter 8. Now, we're in the second part of Daniel, the first part of Daniel, the first six chapters. It's all narrative, the familiar stories, but yet those familiar stories are just loaded with meaning and truth. And from seven on is the prophecies. But the thing that I noted last week about the, the prophecies of Daniel is that in the narrative portion are the prophecy given to the pagan king Nebuchadnezzar, which went from his time all the way to the second coming of Jesus. And the theme was, what would happen to the Jewish people in the custody of Gentile world empires, of which there would be four major ones, but then the last ones in stages. This is called by Jesus in the book of Luke, chapter 21, the times of the Gentiles. The time when the Jewish people would be under custody of Gentile pagan empires as a humiliation, a punishment for their sins, and it goes all the way to the end. Now, everything else that Daniel sees in his part of the prophecies expands on that it's all more detail god wants us to know and the jewish people to know what to expect so daniel is so so essential and last week we saw the daniel's own vision which is the the version the lord gave him of the king, of the metal man the, the 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 statue of the man with gold silver bronze and iron and then iron mixed with clay and then ten toes and then the second coming of Christ who shatters the image and sets up the kingdom. In Daniel's vision, he doesn't see a metal man. He sees um, four beasts, each one just ferocious. To, to God, the, the kings and uh, the rulers and the empires of this world and the states of this world are beastly. And the climax, though, comes when finally the world will come under the rule of a person, a man, not a beast. And that man is the son of man. That's, that's Daniel 7. Now let's start in Daniel 8 because he focuses in on two of these four beasts. And he gives us a double prophecy. I'll show you what I mean by that. Daniel chapter 8. In the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, so it's still the Babylonian Empire, a vision appeared unto me, even unto me Daniel, after that which appeared unto me at the first. So this is his second vision. And I saw in the vision, and it came to pass when I saw that I was at Shushan in the palace. Okay, look, Shushan is the capital, one of the capitals of the Persian Empire. But it's still the Babylonian Empire. And Daniel not only had a vision, he had a vision in the palace at Shushan. So he's already basically in the next empire, which is in the province of Elam, which is in uh, western Iran. And I saw in a vision, and I was by the river Uli. Then I lifted up my eyes and saw, and behold, there stood before the river a ram which had two horns, and the two horns were high, but one was higher than the other, and the higher came up last. And I saw the ram pushing westward and northward and southward, so that no beast might stand before him. Neither was there any that could deliver out of his hand, but he did according to his will, and he became great." And I was, as I was considering, behold, a he-goat came from the west on the face of the whole earth and touched not the ground. And the goat had a notable horn between his eyes. And he came to the ram that had two horns, which I had seen standing before the river. And he ran unto him in the fury of his power. And I saw him come close to the ram, and he was moved with choler, which is rage against him and he smote the ram and break his two horns and there was no power in the ram to stand before him but he cast him down to the ground and he stamped upon him and there was none that could deliver the ram out of his hand what a vision 
Therefore the he-goat waxed very great. And when he was strong, the great horn was broken. And for it came up four notable ones. So the great horn was broken, and then suddenly he sprouted four horns, which were toward the four winds of heaven. So one horn going in every single direction, north, south, east, west. Now let's stop here. We'll go into more detail, but uh, Daniel is 69 years old. He's living in Babylon, but all of a sudden in the vision he's taken to Persia, and he's standing in the very palace that he would one day know well. He'd know it well personally. The ram was the guardian spirit, literally, of the Persian kingdom. That was their symbol. In fact, the kings would go into battle wearing a ram's horn head, a helmet. And it, but the ram had two horns because there's two people groups, the Medes and the Persians. The Medes and the Persians. Now, we call the Medes uh, the Kurds. They still exist. Now, they are the biggest stateless group in the world. 62 million people without a state. Kurdistan would be has been carved up, part of it belongs to Iran, part of it to Iraq, part of it to Sir Syria, part of, part of it to Turkey. And all four of those nations have this in common. They hate Kurds. They hate them with a passion. Well, this is the Medes. Now, in the ancient Persian Empire, the primary uh, dominant group at first was the Medes, but eventually the Persians. See, the one horn was powerful, but the next one even went higher. And it was the Persians that were the dominant ones, okay? And uh, he says that this, this ram would, went forth boldly. Like in, in the previous vision, it was a bear. And he said, rise and kill and eat much flesh. And the bear had three ribs in his mouth, okay? Well, now in this vision, it's a ram. And he goes wherever he wants, it says. And he goes in three directions. He goes west, and he goes north, and he goes south. Because he, he, he west, the ram, the ram went and took Babylon. It would take Babylon. Now, this is all in the future. But Daniel sees it. And he would even take Syria. And he would take what we call Turkey now. And then he'd head north. And there's a place called Armenia that he took. And then he'd head south. And the ram went and took Egypt and Ethiopia. The Persian Empire was vast all the way from Africa to India. India, and this ram was voracious. He was powerful. He was huge. Like we said last week when we talked about the ponderous, heavy-duty bear. They're not very fast, but they're powerful, right? The, the, the Persian army at one time could boast two million soldiers. Okay, this is massive, especially for the time. He went in all these different directions, and it says he did what he wanted. Now, this is a repetitive phrase in Daniel about these beasts and these empires and these kings and these men. They do whatever they want. And then it says he magnified himself. Now, this actually happened in history after this vision. It happened. Okay. And then he sees a he-goat. Oh, you know, a ram, you think power and strength and huge. A goat, I mean, they can look pretty mangy sometimes. The goat, though, was the zodiac sign for what would become the Hellenistic Empire, the Greek Empire. And actually, the, the, the Aegean Sea. You know what Aegean means? Goat. That's the goat sea. Okay. So these, 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 these images, they stay till today. They're now, right? They're very much now. And that goat comes from the west, and it says, though, he did not even touch the ground. He was so fast and ferocious, and with speed, it looked like he was flying, and he smashes into the ram. The notable horn, the one horn on the goat. Okay, and, that, and we've talked about this before, but it's worth talking about again. Daniel repeats it quite a bit. The notable horn is a prediction of Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great came from Macedonia, which is in the Greek world. His father was King Philip. They were the hillbillies and backwater people of the world, okay? Even the Greeks couldn't stand them. They thought they were backwards, they were buck tooth hillbillies, right? But Philip had a desire to, uh, to punish the Persian Empire for 
the Peloponnesian War. They, they had humiliated and hurt the Greek people and, and ground them into the dirt and everything, and he always wanted to get vengeance. Now, he built up an army and everything like that, but he died before he could carry out his will, and he bequeathed the empire to his son, Alexander. Alexander was very young when he took over, but he was a brilliant person. His teacher was Aristotle. You've heard of Aristotle? That was his personal tutor. <laughs> he was, it's really very unusual. I mean, it's just so fascinating, right? And uh, he, uh, he's going to take up. So he invaded, he invaded Persia with 30,000 troops. He, but he had new military techniques that were almost irresistible, like the phalanx. And with 30,000 troops, he outmaneuvered this massive, mighty empire. This, but it's all muscle-bound empire. It's so big, it's so unwieldy. For example, he tricked, the Greeks were great sailors. He tricked them in the Battle of Salamis into a sea battle in which he maneuvered the great big Persian navy into these real narrow straits among islands and, and, and an archipelago. And then the, 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 the Greeks took advantage. They had lighter, quicker ships, and they just smashed and burnt the Greek fleet. And the funny thing is the emperor of, of the, uh, they smashed the Persian fleet. The emperor was set, set up his throne on a mountain. He wanted to watch this, and he sat there and watched his own army just decimated, destroyed, okay? The, the speed, the tactics, the rage, well, obviously it was spiritual. It, was, it had to be more than just human, right? It was spiritual. God said the next emperor is going to be the Greek, Greek empire. And so he sends Alexander, and Alexander goes after these Persians in three or four battles. He just smashed them, just crushed them, just destroyed their armies, and totally, uh, totally defeated them. And this is the notable horn. Now look, Alexander had his own burden, and I believe God used it. God used every one of these emperors, empires, even though they're pagan and Gentile. He used every one of them specifically. Now, what God did through Alexander is this. Alexander was a kind of evangelist, but not of the gospel. He was an evangelist of Greek culture. He thought it was superior. And he literally evangelized Greek culture, which is called Hellenism, and the Greek language all over the world. He made the Greek language into the lingua franca of the ancient world. Everyone had to speak Greek. Now, how did this help? Well, God knew that within a few centuries, he's going to be sending out messengers to the ends of the earth to preach that Jesus Christ had died and rose from the dead and his death was accepted by God as a sacrifice for our sins. When you read the book of Acts, notice, you never say, you never read Paul and Mark and Peter. They had to go find some translators and talk to the people in their own language. They didn't have to because the lingua franca was Greek. Everyone spoke Greek. Jesus spoke Greek. The apostles spoke Greek. Everyone in the world spoke Greek. So it became a very easy thing to go into all the world at that point. I mean, easy in that sense. And preach the gospel. Okay. Now, this is Alexander the Great. I don't think Alexander was great by moral standards or, or anything like that. But he was uh, uniquely great in many ways. He was a shrewd, shrewd man. So this is Alexander, the forcible evangelist of Hellenism. And it says, as soon as the, the he-goat destroys the ram and tramples on him and stomps him into the ground, and he's, when he's at his highest point, all of a sudden the horn's broken. Now, Alexander the Great uh, goes as far as India. His, tr his troops almost mutiny on him. They just, he just took them too far away. But then he goes back to Babylon, and he gets drunk, and he cries in Babylon. He cries. It's noted in history. And why did he cry? Because he couldn't think of any place else he could conquer. I mean, he was a great conqueror. He's only 33. And then he died. He died at 33. Anyone know anyone else that died at 33? He's kind of an anti-Jesus. He's the opposite of Jesus. He's an anti-Christ. Okay. Now, it says that... Uh, now, this would correspond to the belly and the thighs of the statue and to the leopard 
in Daniel's vision. See, all these are tied together. Well, the belly and the thighs, that's where you disseminate things from your thighs and your, and your loins. Well, he disseminated the Greek language and the Greek culture. Now, it became such a problem for Israel in the time between the Testaments. Let me tell you how bad it was. The whole world was being Hellenized. A lot of the world liked that. But it, for Israel, that's a problem because Hellen, Hellenism is pagan. Now, what they do is they come, it was just like America now. After a while, you start seeing these major cities all over the world. They all look the same. You know, they all got a Kentucky Fried Chicken and this and that and the other. Okay, in Hellenism, like they'd set up like these gymnasiums, but those are uh, not what we call a gym where you go to work out and get healthy. It was about health and everything, their idea of health, but it was also about the worship of the male form, and it was very homosexual, and they set up gymnasiums. Now, guess what? They got to the point where they even set up a gymnasium in the holy city of Jerusalem, not that far from the temple, okay? This is Hellenism, all right? Uh, the high priest of Israel, who's the most important person in the nation, for he represents the whole nation before God, took on a Greek name, okay? He became Jason, okay? That means he discarded his Hebrew name, which is usually incorporates the name of God. This is so bad. Now, by the way, this is where the Pharisees started. The Pharisees did not start bad. They started good because these people are saying, we've had it. They're just like now. Conservative people have said, this is sick. We are not going to let go of our culture. We're going to fight for it. And they had a back to the Bible movement, and they made it their life's goal to reinstitute the Torah in a time, and we'll get into this, Daniel predicts it, where Hellenism got so bad that they were, there was a leader, the little horn, who would execute anyone in Israel who was known to circumcise their child and who would force reverse circumcisions on young men. I don't even know how that would work, but it doesn't sound good, okay? Uh, this is bad. Who would burn scrolls and everything like that? Well, th that's where the Pharisees came from. They were the back to the Bible movement, and they made it their life's goal to keep all 614 of the laws of God, which they de derived from the Torah. And I mean, they were serious about it, okay? So I can relate to that, okay? But, you know, by the time Jesus came, they were seriously calcified, too. Just like ch there's churches now. That if you would have seen them 150 years ago, the Methodists and people like that, you could go and hear the gospel in almost any Protestant church, okay? But where are they now? You might hear about the shack, or you might hear about gay rights, or some crazy, ludicrous thing. Then, you know, things get calcified if the Spirit doesn't touch us. Now, let me go on, okay? So the, the, the goat, the, the horn is broken at his prime. But then four horns spout out. Now in the previous chapter, it had a similar thing. Four heads of the leopard. Okay. What is that? Well, when Alexander died, now, now Daniel did not know this except by the Spirit because it, wasn't, it hadn't happened yet. It's going to be 300 years before it happens. But by the Spirit, he was shown. Because when Alexander died... He didn't have children to leave his throne to. So his four generals split up the kingdom. See, break it up into four parts. Now those four generals are very, very important. Well, two of them especially become very prominent later on in the book of Daniel. You got a guy named Cassander who basically took the Macedonian area where they came from. Lysimachus who basically took the western part, Italy and Turkey, but he's not as important. Cassander's not important. But you got a person and his dynasty named Seleucid, Seleucus. He got the Holy Land, and he got Syria. And then to the south of him, Alexander had a general named Ptolemy who got Egypt. Now those two will become increasingly important, and here's why. Because they're always at war with each other. One's called in the Bible by Daniel, the king of the north, and the other is the king of the south. Now, if Egypt wants to fight Syria, guess where they got to march right through? 
See, God put Israel in a very vulnerable place. It's the crossroads of three continents. Anyone goes anywhere, they got to go through there. <laughs> it's like the worst possible place, unless you're right with God. If you're right with God, it's inviolable. In the days of David and Solomon, there was no one crossing over Israel and trampling them into the dust. But when they backslid, that became the doormat for the world. Jesus said, if the salt loses its savor, what good is it? It will be trampled under foot of men. Okay. The king of the north is a secular king and the king of the south is the secular king and the king of the north and the king of the south are always at war for generation after generation after generation and Israel is always in the middle and being trampled right over now that's the future see remember this is about the times of the Gentiles what's going to happen to my people what's going to happen to the Jews what's going to happen to Israel well here's the future and Daniel like when by the time we get to chapter 10 11 you will see the most detailed prophecy in the bible there's like 113 predictions of history all very detailed and they all came to pass i mean it's amazing so let me go on here so that's what happens all right now verse 7 i saw him come close unto the ram Verse 7, this is the goat. He was moved with collar against him. He smote the ram, broke his two horns. There was no power in the ram to stand before him, but he cast him down to the ground and stamped on him, and there was none that could deliver the ram out of his hand. So uh, the Persian power was broken. You know, you know how big the Persian Empire was? It included Afghanistan. It included Pakistan. It included... Uh, Ethiopia, the Middle East, the Levant, the whole thing. And that was just stamped down, and Alexander the Great took over. And this is the funny thing, though. Like I said last week, all these ancient empires, which didn't amount to anything 100 years ago, all relics, now they're prominent again in the world. It's like the end corresponds to the beginning. As it was at the beginning, so shall it be at the end. Okay. Now let me go on. Therefore the he go waxed very great, and when he was strong, the great horn was broken, for it came up for it came up four notable ones toward the four winds of the heaven. And out of one of them came forth a little horn. Remember him from last week, which waxed exceedingly great toward the south and toward the east. And toward the pleasant land, which is the Daniel's uh, Holy Spirit name for Israel, the beautiful land, the pleasant land. And it, it, the little horn, waxed great, even to the host of heaven. And it cast down one of the hosts and of the stars to the ground and stomped upon them. So now th this is a person that to Daniel is future. But to us, it's history. And he, he did come. It was a real person. You know who he is. Antiochus IV, Antiochus Epiphanes, was the first little horn. Okay. And he did. It said he rose up and he went and he was had the control of the beautiful land. He is the one that outlawed circumcision, burnt the Bibles, persecuted the Jews. He is the one that killed and executed people for circumcision or for keeping Sabbath. He is the one who eventually did something that Daniel calls the abomination of desolation. He actually sacrificed a pig on the altar of God and he profaned the temple of God and he cast down the, uh, the high priest, that's the host of heaven, the most important person in Jewish economy or in Jewish religion is the high priest for he represents the whole thing and Antiochus just trampled on him just destroyed him and uh, he stamped him to the ground he brought down the stars he destroyed the priests he killed the priests he tried to destroy the religion now you had now I'm going to tell you something to, for the Jews to the Jews credit you had Jews dying rather than breaking Sabbath. You had Jews willing to die for circumcision. You had Jews willing to die to resist idolatry. I mean, they, they put their life on the line, and man, if there's ever a time where they shined, it, it, some of them, it was then. In fact, we're coming upon a holiday. Anyone know what the next Jewish holiday is? 
Nope. Well, yeah, that'd be the next one according to Leviticus. But they incorporated a new one because of this. Hanukkah. Hanukkah. Look, what is Hanukkah? Hanukkah commemorates the depredations of Antiochus Epiphanes. Hanukkah means dedication. So basically, what happened is they finally had enough, and these people called this long story. We'll get into it, because Daniel does, so we got to. The Maccabees uh, rose up, and other Jews, and said, we've had enough. And they had a rebellion against him. And w when they finally were able to regain the temple, it had been desecrated, and there was only one day's worth of sacred oil because in the temple you have to have a fire going at all times and everything like that it's not just you can't just set it it's got to be a fire of god so they had sacred oil and everything and there's only one day and it would take a while to accumulate the rest of it but that one day's oil supply lasted eight days in the temple that's why a hanukkah candle has eight uh, a candelabra with eight branches to remember a miracle happened there. Now, lest you think that it's an invalid holiday because it's not Leviticus, Jesus kept it in John chapter 10. He was there in Jerusalem for the Feast of Dedication. That's the dedication he's talking about. That's Hanukkah. So um, anyway, uh, this commemorates what Daniel here was predicting in the future, the little horn and his deprivations. Verse 11, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host. That would be the high priest. He exalted himself over the high priest of Israel. And by him the daily sacrifice was taken away. And the place of his sanctuary was cast down. In other words, he profaned the, the holy of holies. And he ended the daily, he forbid the daily sacrifices. Now this is very important too. Because look, if you don't mind me digressing. The Jewish world is on the verge of building another temple and resuming those sacrifices. And there will be another and fuller and more complete manifestation of Antiochus Epiphanes, Antichrist. And he will first allow them to offer the sacrifices. But if there's one thing that's going to mark the Antichrist out, and everyone that knows will know, and they will not doubt, and I hope we're not even here for it, but we might be, so get ready, is that he will have started this, allowed them to do the sacrifices, but then in the middle of a seven-year period, he will end the sacrifices. He said, no, no more sacrifices on this temple. Now, it's kind of tricky because those sacrifices are abominations to God anyway, as we read in Isaiah. But the point is, is Antiochus ended the sacrifices, and the last Antichrist ended the sacrifices, and there's only one other person that ended the sacrifices. Jesus. Now, Jesus is the only one that did it le le uh, legitimately. How did Jesus end the sacrifice? By offering himself as the perfect and complete sacrifice for which no other sacrifice is valid. I mean, there are so many things happen right after the cross, because if you remember, the temple remained for 40 years. And they had the Jews, you know, you accumulate all these things that they talk about, the traditions and everything like that. And the Jews had this thing where they would do the Day of Atonement, and they'd send the goat out, and they'd slaughter another goat, and they'd tie a, a white, no, a red string around the goat's neck. And then usually on the night before they let him out into the wilderness, it would turn white. Well, from the time of Jesus' death, it never did that. For the last 40 years, it really freaked him out. Also, they'd send the goat out into the desert, signifying taking away the sins, expiation. Send him out, and, and usually you'd never see that goat again. From the time of Jesus' sacrifice, several times that goat came right back into the city and freaked them out. Like your sins aren't forgiven. They've just come back on you. It's crazy. But Jesus ended the sacrifice le legitimately by offering himself a perfect and complete work in every single way. No sacrifice is valid and no sacrifice is needed. The sacrifice of Jesus, God has put his stamp of approval on it by raising him from the dead. It's enough. It is done. It is finished. Boom. Thank you, Lord. Antichrist, both before Jesus... And after Jesus at the end. 
are going to try to mimic that. They're going to end the sacrifices, but not legitimately. This is a very, very important point. Okay, so anyway, let me go on. Okay, so verse uh, 12, and the host was given him against the daily sacrifice by reason of transgression. And, and he cast down the truth to the ground. And he practiced and prospered. What practiced and prospered? Well, for a while he did. For a while, the, uh, the, the, the Hellenistic project seemed to be the way, the answer. And it looked like biblical religion is gone. Very much like our day. That's what the demoralization campaign's about. That nothing, nothing matters except humanism. So, uh, it goes on to say, Then I heard one saint speaking, and another saint said unto the, that certain saint which speaks, How long will the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? How long is this going to go on? How long? So this is another one of those dreams and visions where he hears people talking in it. He said unto 2,300 days, then will the sanctuary be cleansed. Okay, now, that's a long time. And Jesus mentioned this. And this, is, this will help us understand what Jesus said when he talked about the last days in Matthew 24. He said, the reader of Daniel will understand when you see the abomination that makes the sanctuary desolate. That's what he's talking about. A sacrilege occurs that will make the, the sanctuary uninhabitable. Then flee to the mountains if you're in Judea. Get out. Run. Because then, Jesus said, then will be great tribulation, such as the world has never seen before and will never see again. So, now we're going to get into that 2,300 days. Not tonight, but we will, because it will be revisited. It came to pass when I, even I, Daniel, 15, had seen the vision and sought for meaning. Then, behold, there stood before me as the appearance of a man, and I heard a man's voice between the banks of Uli, which called and said, Gabriel, make this man to understand the vision. <laughs> Fantastic. Gabriel, the man that announced the birth of Christ. So he came near where I stood, and when he came, I was afraid. I fell on my face, but he said unto me, Understand, O son of man, for at the time of the end shall be the vision. What? See, most Bible commentators look at this chapter and limit it to Alexander the Great, the Persian Empire, Antiochus Epiphanes, all these ancient people, which is true and amazing and astonishing that a prophet could look at these details 300 years before they happened and warn the people. But this is, puts a different dimension on it. What's he saying? This is going to happen at the time of the end also. Now, now this, is, this is the funny thing, okay? Think about it. Jesus said in Matthew 24, when you see the abomination of desolation, the reader of Daniel will understand. Then run to the mountains, okay? Well, Jesus is talking 200 years after the abomination of desolation. It had already happened. He even, he even celebrated the Feast of Dedication. He, everyone that he knew knew about that. So basically when he says, when you see the abomination of desolation, he's saying, this happens twice. What this prophecy is for is for something that happens between the New Testament and the Old Testament and the time of the end. That's just very, very understanding. Very, very concerning, I mean. So anyway. Uh, so he came near where I stood, 17. And when he came, I was afraid, fell on my face, and he said to me, Understand, O son of man, for at the time of the end shall be the vision. Now as he was speaking with me, I was in a deep sleep on my face toward the ground, but he touched me, and he set me upright. 
Now, the one thing that Daniel brings out that I think really we need to appreciate is that these visions troubled him. These visions were disturbing. These visions were terrifying, really. He had to be encouraged. He had to be strengthened. He had to be picked up off the ground by the angel. Verse 19, he said, Behold, I'll make you know what shall be in the last end of the indignation, for at the time appointed the end shall be. Now, let me just break this down slowly and surely. The indignation is another way of saying the times of the Gentiles, or is another way of saying the time of Israel's exile is called the indignation. For a brief, brief moment did I turn away from you, saith the Lord. What's a brief moment to the Lord? Well, it's already been 2,000 years. The indignation, he says at the end, the, here's what the indignation will look like at the end. The ram which you saw having two horns are the kings of Media and Persia. Okay. Well, that happened between the two Testaments. But guess what? Persia is a power again. Now, I don't, like, I don't know what's going to happen with this election, but it wouldn't surprise me if uh, Biden takes over. And guess what one of Biden's main goals is? To reinstitute the deal with Iran to give them the $150 billion that Obama promised them and to reinstate their nuclear program. <laughs> it was always going to be a respite, I'm afraid. It was always just going to be a brief break. A grace period, right? The kings of Persia are still there, only they call themselves mullahs because they have that crazy Anayatollahs. The mullahs and Anayatollahs, crazy, crazy form of Islam. Islam itself is crazy. It's absolutely insane. It's a murderer's, pirate's religion. But Shiite Islam is in a class of its own. They go, they go and commune with evil spirits at the bottom of a well in a city called Qom, a sacred city in Iran. And those, what, what, what does those spirits at the bottom of the well want of them? Well, those spirits at the bottom of that well want to institute the uh, final apocalypse, their version, only it's not chaotic enough. Along comes Obama, hey, you want 150 billion? <laughs> I bet it could get chaotic if they got 150 billion in a nuclear program. It could get cha the, even when they were negotiating. By the way, I'm I'm not trying to get off the subject. It's all on the subject. Before they even sat at the negotiation table under Obama, the Iranians said the annihilation of Israel is non-negotiable. The Obama administration said, "All right, let's talk." <laughs> They're insane. Let's go back. It's at the end. The kings of Persia are going to come up. The rough goat is the king of Grecia. And the great horn that is in between his eyes is the first king. Well, that would be Alexander the Great. Now that being broken, whereas four stood up for it, four kingdoms shall stand up out of the nation, but not in his power. And in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to the full, this is a very important phrase, when people are so sinful, there's not even possible to get more sinful. Well, how crazy are we now? Well, you can go to jail if you call a man a man because he wants to be called a woman. We are as the, the cup is almost overflowing. At the time of the end when transgressors are full, he says, a king of a fierce countenance and understanding dark sentences shall come up. This isn't one of the four. This is from the Greek world. A fierce countenance who has understanding of dark sentences. Let me say something about dark sentences. The book of Proverbs opens with this promise. If you read the Proverbs and understand the word of God, then God will give you wisdom and understanding of dark sayings. So it's not just limited to moral darkness, obviously. God doesn't want you to have dark knowledge that way. Someone's going to rise up really unique. 
who could talk our language and talk anybody's language and convince them with some kind of new twist on wisdom where it's going to fool people. He says, out of that kingdom, and by the way, uh, the biblical word for Grecia is usually Yavan, J-A-V-A-N. And this is what tricks a lot of people because the way history's changed, it throws them off. They think Grecia is that little tiny peninsula and those islands in Eastern Europe, which it is. But the biggest section of biblical Yavan is Turkey. Okay, now I'm not, I don't know who the Antichrist is, but he comes somewhere around that part of the world. Now Macedonia is in Europe. Greece is in Europe. Turkey's European. It was all part of the Roman Empire at one time. He says, there's going to come one in the time of the end when the transgressors are almost complete, when they couldn't sin anymore, just like right before the flood. They couldn't do more sin. They had reached the limit of sin. I don't even know what they were doing, but it was so bad, God wiped out the earth. Okay. He says, his power will be mighty, but not by his own power. You know what that means? He will be satanic. He will be a son of Satan. And he will destroy wonderfully. And he will prosper and practice and will destroy the mighty and the holy people. He will. He will be given power, as Revelation says, to make war on the saints and overcome them. And that is going to fly right in the face of a lot of people's uh, victorious theology. That God would actually allow a pagan tyrant to succeed. But God has ways that none, even, even we can't figure out. They're all good and everything he does is good and right. He, Satan was given power to make war on the, whole, on the saints. That's the holy people. But there's another way to understand this too. From Daniel's perspective, who are the holy people? The Jewish people. And they are holy, from my perspective, too. They are holy. Now, the Jews aren't holy morally, uh, for the most part. The Jews aren't holy even spiritually, because they can believe about anything but Christianity. But the Jews are holy in this sense. They are set apart by God for special dealings, so they are holy. And the devil wants to destroy them. He wants to wipe them out. Now, let me go through this. Through his policy also, he will cause craft to prosper. I wonder what that is. The occult? Could be. Did you know Hitler was a deep, 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 what they call an adept at occultism? He was deep into the occult. He will cause the craft to prosper, he says. And he will practice and will destroy the mighty and the holy people. Through his policy, therefore, also he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand. He will magnify himself in his heart. And by peace... He'll destroy many. Now that's so modern that, you know, the whole idea is to make peace at any cost. Sacrifice your beliefs, sacrifice your, um, <laughs> someone <laughs> wisely put on, on uh, the internet this saying that says, that Antichrist is gonna get a great advantage just by quoting love one another, okay? There's a perverted and fake concept of peace and love. It says right here, Antichrist is going to come along and by peace he's going to destroy people. Okay. Well, we also know that the nation of Israel, which is a nation, but it's not a sovereign nation. It's dependent. That's why as soon as they thought Biden won, people wondered about uh, Netanyahu. No, he, he doesn't. He, he's not, it's not personal, like, I like Trump and I don't like... He's got to defend his nation, and they're basically still, in a sense, a vassal. This is still the time of the Gentiles. They depend on us. And the Lord will take away all their lovers, and the Lord will take away all that they depend on, so that in the end they will know that there's God and God alone. Okay, let me go on. Okay, by peace he'll destroy many. He'll also stand up against the Prince of Princes. 
Now Antiochus himself stood up against the high priest of Israel. But this one will directly stand up against, publicly, the Lord Jesus Christ. He will make his stand openly. He will exalt himself. Paul was quoting this verse when he said, he will oppose and exalt himself above all that is called God or that is worshiped as God, so that he shows himself in the temple that he is God. Now there are many, many people with the Antichrist spirit in world power, world leaders, that are, well, they will come right out against Christ. He will exalt himself and stand up against the princes, prince of princes, but he will be broken without hand. He will be broken. Now the Antichrist has this distinction among all humanity. Him and the false prophet are the only two people where God himself, he won't let anyone kill him. God himself will pluck them up and throw them in the lake of fire before they even die. It says in Thessalonians again, then shall that wicked one be revealed, whom the Lord shall destroy with the spirit of his mouth and with the brightness of his coming. So he comes to an inglorious end. He will be broken without hand. And the vision of the evening and the morning, which was told is true, therefore shut thou up the vision. It'll be for many days. And I, Daniel, look what he did. I fainted. You know what? I almost feel like fainting when I really, really get into these prophecies. Because I know there's a great chance we're not just going to have a vision of them. We might have to live through some of these. And I don't relish it. I don't want it. But I want God. And I want the kingdom. Look what Daniel, I, I fainted. It was so terrifying. And I was sick certain days. You know, most of us think, well, you know, if God gave me a dream, I mean, that would just make me feel so good, feel good about myself and everything like that. God showed him something that made him sick for days. Afterward, I rose up and did the king's business. I was astonished at the vision. But no one understood it. Not even him. See, here's what's going to happen. This is what the future is. He'll trample the stars. What are the stars? Well, Jesus said, or God said to Abraham, you see those stars? I'll make your children as numerous as those stars. In Daniel's vision, he will trample the stars. He will magnify himself above the prince of princes. He will exalt himself above Jesus. Memory is the little horn that boasts great things and has names of blasphemy. And Israel is going to be the battleground between these two kings. Now, one thing I want to say in closing, see, it's so uncanny. Because corresponding to the Greeks and corresponding to the Persians, as I said, for centuries, the Persians didn't really account for much. They actually changed their name to Iran to try to appease Hitler. Do you know that? Because they're saying, we're Aryans just like you. Uh, they weren't nothing. They were, you know, they're mighty in their time, but I mean, there has been relics like so many of the Middle Eastern nations. And Turkey was the success story of the West because they marginalized Islam and they really became a secular country. And in the case of Muslims, I approve of secularism because I'd rather have that than Islam, all right? But in the last 40 years, I mean, both of these countries have just transformed, right? And you've seen it. The Ayatollah Khomeini and then Erdogan, it was the most recent one. And here's the thing I'll say, just humanly speaking. Okay, they're, they're all Muslim, but they hate each other. Turkey hates Iran, although one day they will, they will invade Israel together. But they hate them because they're Shiites. And the Turkey are Sunnis, which I won't go into. But, and also, the president of Turkey is not just a Sunni. He's a Sufi. Sufis are like charismatic Muslims. 
Only they're not like charismatic Christians who go around, give prophecies, and speak in tongues and praise God. I'm a charismatic. I believe in the gifts. No, charismatic Muslims go into trances, put knives in themselves and into little boys as they dance in circles with the boys on their shoulders. They are demon-possessed. That's who Erdogan is. Okay, he's a Sufi. He's, he's demon-possessed. Okay. And, and Iran hates the Sunni world. And then... Erdogan hates the Saudis. Now, they're all Sunni, the Saudis and the Turks. I didn't say Sunni. Don't make that mistake. They're actually quite cranky, okay. But they're all Sunni. But the Saudis are considered whorish and decadent, and that they have abused the custody of Mecca and Medina, the holy cities of Sunni. And the Turks also believe that the golden age of Islam was the Ottoman Empire. So the Saudis are unworthy. They hate each other. Now listen, according to this, we'll get into this in, in Daniel 11. The Saudis and Egypt would correspond to the king of the south. Okay. And the Turks would be the king of the north. And they hate each other. And guess what's right between Saudis and Turks? <laughs> Israel. Like a doormat. Like a, an alleyway. Just to be trampled. If they'd only listen to God. If they'd only repent. <laughs> if they'd only turn. But Daniel saw it. Here's what's going to happen. Here's the future. Here's how it's going to play out. And we are on the verge of it in our life. Father, in the name of Jesus. Lord, somebody told me uh, right before this meeting that the Lord gave him a word that said prayer requests. And I'm thinking about that, and I want to share that with everyone here and with all those in Cyberland. The scripture came to me. Do not be anxious about anything. But pray about everything. And with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Lord, may we cast our cares on you and pray to you and depend on you through all of this. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. God bless you.